Hello everyone and welcome to the March Coyote Community Connection. Our topic for this broadcast is Women's History Month and the theme for this year is Women Providing Healing, Promoting Hope. Our guest speaker this month is Miss Sue Raycraft, who is a member of the San Antonio Valley Historical Association along with many other community groups. Thank you, Sue, for joining us today. I look forward to the discussion later in the program. Additionally, for Women's History Month, we are honored to have the Installation Management Command Readiness Division Director, Ms. Brenda Lee McCullough, as our guest speaker for the March 9th event at the Hacienda. I'll talk more about this in my March roll-up. Now, let me take a moment to provide a few statistics on women in the Army. For starters, only 38% of the Department of the Army civilian workforce are women. And I must share that I am extremely proud to work with many of these outstanding women right here at Fort Hunter Leggett, as well as our installation in Dublin, Parks Reserve Forces Training Area. We have many women in leadership roles, such as Miss Natty Littlefield, a military veteran who serves as the Fort Hunter Liggett Director of Resource Management. Miss Littlefield worked diligently with her fellow directors to manage almost $70 million last fiscal year. Next, we have Miss Melissa Foslin, the Plans and Analysis Chief who helps us with reporting requirements and strategic planning. We are also blessed to have Miss Kathy Escalera, who manages the historic Hacienda. Miss Escalera goes above and beyond to ensure top-notch events for all of those living and working on post, as well as our customers in the local community. And then there is Miss Amy Phillips, my public affairs officer who manages all public and media queries, community engagements, and the official Fort Hunter Liggett social media pages. Ms. Phillips is also an Army veteran. These ladies represent just a small sample of the awesome women serving our garrison, as I couldn't possibly name them all. We have so many hardworking women in our workforce and tenant organizations that work side by side with their male counterparts to proudly support the mission at Fort Hunter Liggett and Parks Reserve Forces Training Area. I appreciate them all and it's my privilege to work with them daily. Shifting gears a bit to women in uniform, approximately 18% of the total army is female. In 2016, all military occupations were open to women, with more than 1,400 female soldiers transferred into the infantry, armor, and fire support occupations. 38 women have graduated the Ranger School, the Army's toughest course and the premier small unit tactics and leadership school. Congratulations, ladies. To learn more, visit the Army's website devoted to the female soldiers' achievements and their stories. Now locally, last month I highlighted Colonel Serena Johnson, the Parks Reserve Forces Training Area Commander, and the 91st Training Division Commander, Brigadier General, Patricia Wallace. But there are so many other soldiers and female veterans serving at both of our installations. And I just want to say I recognize all of them and appreciate all that you do for our Army. Now for a quick recap of February. I'd like to start off by thanking Mayor Mike Labar and the entire King City Chamber of Commerce for including me in the speaking panel on February 16th, State of the City Address at the Fairgrounds. 
It was wonderful to finally talk to people in person again. Congratulations to King City for their 2021 achievements and the dedicated city workers that keep the city running. On February 3rd, we had MWR staff member Melissa Lazzarini as the guest speaker for our Go Red for Women walk. Ms. Lazzarini suffered a heart attack three years ago and shared her compelling story of her very traumatic experience and recovery efforts. We learned how she has since improved her eating habits and her living habits to be a healthier person. Please visit our DVIDS page for the story. On February 24th, Brigadier General Patricia Wallace was the guest speaker for our Black History Month observance at the Hacienda. We've published the event video on Facebook and YouTube, so don't worry if you missed it. Afterwards, we had our second Mardi Gras parade and a Mardi Gras party with many people dressed up in themed gear and competitors for the best decorated float or car competition. Go to our Facebook pages to see the event photos. And then for this month, as I mentioned earlier, Miss McCullough, my boss, is our Women's History Month guest speaker on March 9th. She was selected to the Senior Executive Service in April 2015. This position is equivalent to a two-star general officer. As Director of Installation Management Command Readiness, she is responsible for installation management activities at 24 Army installations and joint bases located in 16 states, Puerto Rico and Honduras. So you know, Miss McCullough is a very busy woman and we're honored to have her speaking with us in March. We will also host an additional Women's History Month event on March 21st at the Hacienda featuring the San Antonio Valley Historical Association presentation on a few local women that have made an impact to this community. We look forward to that event and we'll have additional information on both events on our Facebook pages. Now for our guest speaker portion of this program. Ms. Susan Raycraft will provide some detailed information about Belva Lockwood, the namesake of our neighboring Lockwood community. Ms. Raycraft is a Lockwood author and activist who began researching and writing about Belva Lockwood in 1977 when she moved to this area. Sue Ray, as she is known locally, self-published her play, Belva Speaks, in 2012 after performing it for the Lockwood Centennial in 1988 and with the school and historical groups in subsequent years. She is the co-author of a local history book in the Images of America series for Arcadia Publishing titled The San Antonio Valley and released a memoir about her family in 2017 titled My Family Portrait in Letters. I am extremely excited to learn about this trailblazing woman in the legal profession. The floor is yours, Ms. Raycraft. My name is Susan Raycraft. I moved to the Lockwood area in 1977, and I began asking, who, who is this named for? I heard it was some woman um, and it was the post office that was named for her because that's one of the few buildings that established Lockwood as an actual physical place. I discovered eventually that woman was Belva Lockwood and I began what remains today my passion to learn and educate others about this amazing woman who I dubbed the most famous woman no one has ever heard about. And here's some of my accumulated resources back in 
the early days I had to find them by hook and crook. There was no internet. And I eventually wrote a little play about Belva. And uh, this brief presentation is part of nearby Fort Hunter Leggett's Women's History Month observation in 2022. And it continues my passion, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak for Belva. Belva Bennett was born to a farming family in Lockport, New York, about 20 miles from Niagara Falls in 1830. After attending local primary school, she began teaching there at just 14 without any formal education in teaching. At 18, she married a local sawmill owner who actually died four years later in an accident, leaving her with a young daughter. She left that daughter with her parents for three years to enroll in a college that had just opened its doors to women in Lima, Ohio, from where she graduated in 1857. She went back to New York State, and after five years of teaching, owning, and managing various girls' schools there, she took Lura and moved to Washington, D.C. The home she bought there became the center of political action on behalf of women's rights including, of course, suffrage, for decades. In 1868, she married Dr. Ezekiel Lockwood, a dentist and Civil War veteran who shared her passion for women's rights. I like the image of her leaving her port where she was born and finding the wood she would become. Belva set out from Lockport and came to embody the strength of wood, leaving her legacy as Belva Lockwood. After her second daughter died at just two years old, she fought countless barriers to women entering the legal profession to enroll in law school, barred from being in class with young men for fear that the ladies would distract them, and refused her diploma that she had earned Belva finally demanded and received that diploma in 1874 by writing a letter to the president, who was the nominal head of the law school she attended. While that diploma granted Belva access to the D.C. bar, she and her supporters struggled for another five years to gain her admission to practice law in all the courts of the D.C., the district, including the Supreme Court. She worked tirelessly to lobby through Congress a law entitled An Act to Remove Certain Legal Disabilities of Women, which President Hayes signed into law in early 1879, and upon its passage, she presented bouquets of flowers to all who had voted for it. On March 3, 1879, Belva Lockwood became the first woman to argue a case before the Supreme Court. During Women's History Month 2022, let's consider this. Just as it took a full century after the 13th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote, for that right to become a reality for all African Americans. It was over a century after Belva's victory until a woman became a Supreme Court justice. And of course, it's been over a full century since the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote, and we still not had a female president. Back to Belva's history, California was instrumental in her historic bid for the presidency. The National Equal Rights Party of the Pacific Slope met in San Francisco in the summer of 1884. And after reading a letter Belva had written in an editorial that though women could not vote, there was nothing to prevent them being voted for, they offered her their nomination for U.S. president. She accepted without apparent hesitation and mounted a full campaign. Mrs. Lockwood is said to have received about 9,000 votes, though some were actually dumped and not counted. 
She ran again in 1888, the year its first postmaster, Lair Patterson, named the Lockwood Post Office. Although no written proof exists of her being its namesake, it, if it wasn't named for her, it should have been. <laughs> being, Belva continued to practice law in Washington, D.C., and in 1906, her longtime clients, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, received the largest settlement against the United States government recorded to that date, over $5 million. And she was still a rarity, a female um, lawyer. As an activist for peace, Belva traveled the world representing the country at gatherings seeking alternatives to war. Another pathetic commentary on how far we have not come in that arena is watching war unfold in Europe on this very day. In 2019, a local group, the Lockwood Persisters, honored Belva Lockwood by dedicating a bronze plaque surrounded by native plants in front of the post office that bears her name. I invite all to stop by and enjoy the memorial and consider how much one woman accomplished against all odds. Happy Women's History Month and International Women's Day on March 8th to all. Thank you, Ms. Raycraft, for the enlightening us on Mrs. Lockwood's tremendous achievements in the legal profession. Next up is the MWR update. Hello, my name is Brandi Garza, Support Services Supervisor for MWR. Here to let you know about some upcoming events MWR has planned for the month of March. Beginning March 8th, we have the Coyote Fitness Challenge competition hosted by De Anza Sports and Fitness Center. This eight-week challenge will be supported by some fitness classes taught by our own Ivan Garcia and Master T. At the end of the challenge, the participant with the top results will be crowned champion. We will celebrate Women's History Month with an observance on March 9th at the Hacienda beginning at 1330. Our guest speaker will be Brenda Lee McCullough, Director of MCOM Readiness. The Hacienda will also host a St. Patrick's Day party on March 17th and a spring fling on March 19th. The Sports Center will host a bench press and deadlift competition and a March Madness three-point contest. The Cyberary will have its monthly story time and scavenger hunt. The Child, Youth, and Teen Center will also host Read Across America Teen Game Night, Teen Shamrock Shimmy, and the Color Me Green Fun Run. For more event dates and for more information, like us on Facebook at FHL MWR and download the Digital Garrison app. Thank you. I hope you will all find some time in your busy schedules to join us at some of our March events. Now this concludes our broadcast. Please feel free to contact the Public Affairs or MWR offices anytime you have questions or concerns. Thank you for joining us today for the Coyote Community Connection. Our next broadcast will be held on April 7th. Until then, remember to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of our mission. Coyote Strong and Coyote Six out.